welcome to Speaking Freely. At present, there's a reckoning occurring around the world on the impacts of the measures taken during the past three years to stem the spread of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Yet, you wouldn't really know it if you were watching or reading the mainstream news here in Canada. There's actually been very little apologizing or even introspection for the role the media has played in allowing things like our schools to close, our freedom of movement to be abrogated, and even our bodily autonomy to be so grossly violated during the past two years. Now take a policy like elementary school closures. Both domestically and globally, these have now been found to be associated with not just severe learning losses, as these might have even been anticipated by the lockdown proponents, but also with worse health outcomes as well. To take one example, there's been higher than expected mortality risk for children, both in low-income economies where those same children were forced to work when their schools closed, but it's also happened here in Canada with a worsening of physical and mental health caused by prolonged periods of inactivity and lack of social connection. And this has led to a suicide crisis in youth under 20. The other hidden story has been the disproportionate impact that COVID had on our most vulnerable members in society. I'm talking about seniors in nursing homes and those who were left to care for them, or the food processing workers whose work was deemed essential at the start of the pandemic and who ended up working in very poorly ventilated spaces and who contracted COVID as a result. Now, many of those workers were doubly affected because they were either recent immigrants or more likely temporary foreign workers without the typical supports available to all other Canadians. Now, turning back to our senior care, lockdowns had the perverse effect of preventing family members and caregivers from providing the care that their loved ones needed. And it was left to a system which was threadbare at the best of times, it was left to that system to shoulder the burden of care with not enough resources and certainly not enough people. As detailed in the book, Spin Doctors by Nora Laredo, nearly half of all of deaths from COVID-19 in Canada occurred in our nursing homes and in our care facilities. And after being spotlighted early on in the pandemic, this story of our senior care has been largely buried. And finally, what are we to make of the vaccine strategy? Everything from passports to mandates, did any of this actually help? Or did it instead breed mistrust and so further division in our societies? giving fuel to pardon the pun to movements like the truckers protests of February, 2022, or even the growing vaccine hesitancy movement that's now extending to longstanding treatable illnesses. So the question for our guest on our show today, Dr. Matt Strauss, acting medical officer of health for Haldeman Norfolk in Southwest Ontario is, could we have done better? Could public health have better communicated with the public? And could it have better guided our politicians to more sensible long-standing policies. Dr. Strauss is a critical care physician. He was actually on the front lines of the first and second COVID waves when they arrived in Canada in the spring and later fall of 2020 and 2021. So I'm sure he can speak firsthand of what he witnessed. But he was also, interestingly, one of the first prominent Canadian medical voices to share concerns he had over lockdown policies that were being borrowed from authoritarian regimes like the People's Republic of China. Now, as a medical doctor who also holds a journalism degree, he was also one of the first in Canada to write articles and ask, what are the social determinants of health? Or why are we not learning from non-authoritarian responses like Taiwan or Sweden? Well, if you join us after the break, when we explore what we've learned about the pandemic response, with our guest, Dr. Matt Strauss. There was an over response by giving people money uh, and not working. And, and not requiring the people to work. I would think that's the biggest harm that's done. No, I, I, I'm thankful to, to, to Ford. I think he's doing a good job with, uh, you know, with COVID. 
and everything else. And we're very lucky to live here. They really take good care of us. Well, I think I think most policies were were adequate. They they targeted um, or their attempt was to isolate people and stop the spread of the virus and ask people to wear masks so they wouldn't spread it to other people. Yeah. You know? It's easy to point fingers at people that have to do the pol uh, have to come up with the policies and and uh, at times that things that they don't really don't want to do, but uh, the social good in terms of public health and uh, and short sh short term gain uh, pains for long term gains uh, was needed, right? So uh, I think it's easy to criticize people in uh, in governmental positions that were making these decisions, but um, they needed to take action. So welcome back to Speaking Freely. Today's episode is titled The COVID Contrarians, and we're speaking with one of those voices that during the COVID pandemic spoke out about certain measures that were taken things like school closures, uh, lockdowns, vaccine passports. Um, this took courage, but it also took knowledge about the area in which uh, these opinions were being expressed. So on today's show, we have the Acting Medical Officer of Health for Haldeman Norfolk, which is in southwestern Ontario for our national audience. And even that in Ontario might not know this part of the province exists. But uh, Matt, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so you're a doctor yourself, mm -hmm. a medical doctor, who before becoming the medical officer of health for this southwestern region of Ontario, worked as an ICU doctor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in fact, you still do, if I understand I that do, correctly. I yeah. do, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that um, experience during the pandemic, and then I'll let the audience know how I came to know you, which was in a very different er uh, realm, which was writing a piece in The Spectator, which for those of you who don't know, it's not The Hamilton Spectator, it's The Spectator in the UK, it's a uh, several hundred year old publication, one of the oldest publications in English. Um, people like John Stuart Mill published in this. And you were one of the early pieces that I read that said, hold on a second, uh, these sort of uh, non-pharmaceutical non interventions, NPIs like lockdowns are actually not the norm. These aren't things that public health professionals have advocated before. We've kind of imported them from uh, the experience of China then. And maybe we should be raising questions. You were one of the first voices I heard about that. But how did you go from being a doctor, an ICU uh, physician, to writing a piece in The Spectator? Okay. And becoming the acting Medi medical officer of health for Norfolk Halloween. Sure enough. I think I, I may have been a born skeptic. Um, I, uh, as an ICU doctor, well, actually, I'll tell you, on the first day of medical school, um, the endocrinologist who taught one of our first lectures said, half of what you learn in medical school will be wrong. You need to be open-minded and skeptical and always willing to revise your priors. Mm -hmm. um, and that turned out to be true just in the 10 years that I was practicing critical care medicine. Several randomized control trials showed that things that I was taught mm -hmm. by my forebears worked, right. don't work. And I became very sensitive to that and um, really reevaluated all of my practices in critical care um, and just urged my colleagues to let's follow the evidence, let's let's improve our practices. Mm. Um, and it was with that mindset that I um, became involved in journalism and doing a fellowship at the Monk School. And it's with that mindset that I took up a faculty position at Queen's to get sort of you know, mm. educate the young about mm -hmm. there are a lot of, there's a lot of room for intellectual inquiry in medicine. We need to be doing it if we're going to improve medicine because our forebearers in medicine yeah. used to bleed people. Yeah. Um, and never used to wash our hands. Yes. It, was, it was considered heretical that you would think you could uh, harm someone by not washing your hands as a surgeon and so on. Yeah, and so for, for whatever reason, I, I wound up on this beat. As a journalist, I wrote something for Vice. I, I enjoy counterintuitive thinking. Um, that is evidence-based. So as a journalist, I, I wrote something for Vice News. Um, you know, it's believed that cannabis causes people to be overweight. Actually, all of the data shows the opposite. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wrote something for an outfit called The Conversation about how um, it's true that antidepressants have randomized controlled trial data to show that they help treat depression, but so does nature bathing. That means going for a walk in the woods. Right. So does joining a drum circle or a choir. Right. Um, so does the Mediterranean diet. So there's all sorts of counterintuitive things that I was interested in, but always and only from an evidence-based perspective. So mm. um, 
that I suppose was my background as a dyed in the wool skeptic. So when people started proposing things to deal with COVID, which is a hell of a problem, I was seeing patients who were terribly harmed by it. I had many patients die, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was also seeing people harmed by some of the restrictive measures that we were doing. And so I was saying, guys, we got to step back, do a cost benefit analysis, say, do these measures we're doing work? Each yeah. and every one of them. Let's be yeah. skeptical. Um, and, and I was skeptical of so many other things, including ivermectin and mm -hmm. uh, remdesivir and mm -hmm. vitamin D and hydroxychloroquine. So I, I, I'm just a dyed in the wool skeptic. That's really right. how I wound up in, in the spectator. And maybe to, to push back a little bit, um, I, I think you also have a set of values, right? We'll get into that in a moment. But you also were a skeptical of the, um, well, I would say, abrogation, breaking of old, well-established values around medicine. So in other words, some of the proposals that were brought in, again, without much evidence to, to stop the spread and so on, also ran afoul of very kind of da, um, tried and true medical principles like consent, yes. like informed consent. Um, like we were talking earlier, just before the, the cameras started roll, a right to education mm -hmm. is also a health requirement. Like pe kids who aren't in school have well-known health problems, not just in the moment, but the, the school is closed, but even later on in life. So can you speak to us about the values too that you have perhaps prior to becoming a doctor and the ones you've learned as a doctor that then informed also your views on different interventions during the COVID pandemic? Um, so I guess some values I have as a doctor, you, you mentioned consent. I don't know how to be a doctor without practicing in a consent-based manner. Um, I know that every medical intervention has potential downsides. Mm -hmm. You can, you can I, I can prescribe penicillin for an infection and it can cause you to die of anaphylaxis. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't have that death on my conscience uh, unless I know that you understood the risks and you agreed to them. Mm -hmm. um, without that consent, I, I can't practice medicine in good conscience. So um, when we were doing coercive things, and governments do coercive things, I understand that, but it, it was really concerning to me when I saw medical doctors um, from a professional standpoint calling for coercion and, and, mm. and then also saying, so that's the values issue, but then when they were saying the science proves we need to do this coercion, that was more the skeptical uh, data-based right. issue. Right. Um, you spoke, I guess, about what I would call holism in medicine, treating the whole person and yeah. being patient-centered. And yeah, as an ICU doctor, um, I can do something drastic and interventional, like put you on a ventilator um, for a week because your uh, emphysema is acting up. But if, if you don't stop smoking, um, and, and there's a lot of reasons why people smoke. They smoke yeah. for stress. There's um, economic reasons why um, folks might um, turn to uh, substances beyond other mm. things. Um, and... I, I sometimes put the same person on a ventilator three times in a year for um, conditions like emphysema or like uh, diabetes that wasn't being properly managed um, that really came from an absence of whole person or public health, one might say. Right. And the personal decisions of individuals. We don't judge. When someone comes to your hospital and mm. they're sick, you don't ask why. I mean, you do ask why to prevent the reoccurrence, mm -hmm. but not as a condition of treatment. Absolutely. Right. I, I, yeah. in, in some ways, and I say this for myself and for my family, Everyone who, not everyone, the majority of people who wind up in hospital had some amount of personal choice that led there. Mm -hmm. um, if you were in a car accident and you chose not to wear your seatbelt, or if you were in a car accident and you were cho choosing to text or choosing to speed, I don't ask that mm -hmm. when you have a closed head injury. Like that's, right. that's not part of medical treatment. We, we have always been kind of come one, come all. And that, that's an important value that I- Right, and so people know in the audience here, you are critical uh, care unit physician and the ICU units that would have also been uh, receiving COVID patients mm -hmm. that had gotten very sick, mm -hmm. they would have come to you. Yeah, I, I, I treated um, uh, probably between 100 and 200 COVID patients okay. who were critically ill over the, over the pandemic. Okay, so I wanna now switch from the medical role to the public health role that you now occupy. Mm -hmm. and maybe for our audience too, you were telling me some very interesting things just before camera rolled about the origins of public health in the history of public health and kind of who occupied those roles early on when these roles were developed and, and, and how that might have changed and how that might also have affected the way policies rolled out at the beginning of the pandemic and um, very much throughout, um, especially here in, in Canada and, and, and so on. So can you walk us through a little bit of that? 
Uh, absolutely. So I, I, I mean, one of the points that I made, and it might have been a, a bit of a point in self defense. The first <laughs> medical officers of health were physicians who were um, in the communities that they serve, practicing clinical medicine, um, and then became aware of the absence of public health. Got kind of politically activist. Um, so I think the first one was uh, Dr. Duncan in Dublin, who. Um, uh, sorry, it wasn't Dublin. I think I think it was Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, there were there were all sorts of Irish immigrants coming over, right. living in slums, not having proper sanitation. Right. And he lobbied and lobbied and prepared reports for the city council there. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, you know what? You, you seem very taken with this issue. Be the medical officer of health. It was a, it was an entirely new office that was invented. So he was right. a family doctor who had had worked there um, for ten years and, and knew the community quite well. John Snow is a very famous yeah. medical officer of health who I believe was an anesthetist. Um, so I would say that I came to the field in a similar way where I was practicing medicine in the community. I became increasingly, increasingly concerned about the direction of pandemic policy in this province. There was an opening. Some members of the community said, hey, would you mind applying? Because I think you'd be a good fit for the community. And that's how I found my way in. Wow. So this was actually persons that were living in Haldeman, Norfolk, yep. Norfolk, Haldeman. Uh, and they knew about your um, public uh, uh, stance on certain pandemic policies, and they felt that would have um, matched with the feelings of persons there uh, yes. in the community. So very much a bottom-up, seemingly, uh, uh, role that I was would created. Say, yeah. And you mentioned uh, before, again, cameras rolled, that it's interesting how people can be appointed. You're the acting medical officer of health because you were appointed by that local public health board. Is that how it worked? Yes. Okay. And if anyone is appointed by the minister, mm -hmm. they are then the medical officer of health. Yes. Okay. Um, so acting shouldn't just be, you know, you were temporary in, in having the role. It was kind of how you were hired. I think that if you are acting, um, you should either be making plans to to become full at some point yeah. or, or should accept that it's temporary. In my case, I was concerned about pandemic policy. Um, the pandemic by my lights is over. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then for some You said that reasons, back in the spring. Yeah, yeah, I but yeah. I wanted to see through this last winter and make sure that no that, that I was at the table for yeah. there was a push for more of yeah. these um, counterproductive restrictions, and I wanted to be at the table for those conversations. Mm. Um, so I, I feel that the direction of policy is is righted mm -hmm. in this province. I'm not crediting myself for that entirely, mm -hmm. but I, I did get to be part of those discussions. So maybe we can just delve in that uh, too. Um, the things like school closures, elementary school closures. I'm talking about not in sort of higher education, um, you were, again, very prescient to sort of note, hey, everyone, there's health costs to closing elementary schools, both for children, for families, mental health uh, primarily, but also other physical health affected. There's the permanent effects that school closures might have on this generation of students. And now that seems to be all vindicated. I mean, there's, there's countless reports. In fact, the whole tenor of uh, this fall was across the country was how do we repair the damage with mm. the normal school year? Do you feel in any way <laughs> a sense of um, in pride that you were at least the first or do you feel saddened that, you know, voices like yours weren't listened to uh, when they were making this case? Like, wh where's your feeling now? I know you said it's over, but do you have any sort of thoughts on maybe perhaps how this can happen again? I suppose I feel some amount of both. I know that I'm kind of congenitally more outspoken than some folks. And I, <laughs> I know that even when I was being very outspoken um, among my colleagues, I didn't feel that I was in the minority. Um, it's hard because there's some selection bias, right? Mm. People might be more likely to, in, to a, in a friendly conversation, um, offer the opinions that they know you'll agree with. But it seemed to me that kind of two thirds of the intensivists that I know were more of my mindset than mm. the, the dominant media narrative. Interesting. So I would, Jury still out on whether I was foolish or prescient um, to be so outspoken, but I, 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 I was really speaking from a long tradition. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I stood up for these things. I, I, I do feel that I managed to get the, the ship steaming in the right direction, because mm -hmm. um, you, to some extent, you faced. It. So for those that don't know, in Ontario, we probably had some of the harshest and longest lockdowns in North America. Yes, at least compared to the states that, that did the same thing. But certainly in Canada, there was a great variation. We know that in BC, they had schools open in June 2020. Mm. But as a country, we weren't talking, we weren't traveling, and I think we were just in these bubbles. So mm -hmm. for those of you that don't know, Ontario closed schools at four times. So it was one of the long, and then also closed down businesses, and mm -hmm. small businesses in particular were hit hard. So your voice here did, did make a difference, I think. Um, but 
can you tell me a little bit about the just the political side of being a say a public health officer because you know my prior to this was was thinking that these officers maybe hold too much power uh, but maybe not enough in other circumstances in the sense that they seem to be throwing out their uh, playbook when it came to COVID. From my understanding of public health, there is a whole slew of evidence that says the social determinants of health are really predictive of well-being in a society. That is schooling, education, uh, housing, uh, having meaning in your life. And when these things are thrown out, your health can deteriorate. And I thought that's what public health would espouse. So when I saw them very quickly jettisoning that and appropriating uh, techniques like lockdowns that seem to be coming from authoritarian regimes, I thought something had gone wrong and something uh, that had protected their role was seemingly uh, gone. And they felt nervous about advocating for the traditional public health role and it switched. Um, but that's the question for you. Well, why that switch might have happened or maybe I've got it all wrong. After the break, we'll get your answer. Okay. So join us right after to hear uh, Dr. Matt Strauss tell us more about the public health response to COVID and what he thinks going forward will be uh, some lessons that we can learn as a society. So see you after the break. So welcome back to Speaking Freely. Um, when we ended our last break, I just... Uh, summarized a question that dealt with the field that Dr. Strauss uh, now is uh, emblematic of. He's a medical officer of health. But the field of public health had traditionally looked to things like um, our social environment and our economic well-being as a determinant of health. Now, that to my mind was, I thought, the playbook of public health, and which is why they, on every pandemic planning uh, document that I could read, prior to the pandemic, and these were revised and were, were at the ready when the pandemic hit, the SARS-CoV-2 the SARS, uh, pandemic virus hit, all said we should keep things as normal as possible for the very reason that society requires these things as a function of our health. Not as a function of keeping the economy going, but rather keep our society healthy. Mm. Why was this jettisoned? Because it just seemed so antithetical to the premise of public health, which is around these social determinants of health, how well-being is, is created uh, in a society that keeps people at work, giving them meaning, socializing. In fact, we were appointing ministers of loneliness at the UK because mm. they were so worried about the health detrimental effects of this alienation we were creating in society. Why was that all abandoned? And what, what's your take on it and why that happened? Yeah, I, I think ultimately broad social movements are multifactorial. And as a non-social scientist, I can only say what my impression is. It's, it's ultimately a little bit speculative. I think the fact that this particular pandemic started in an authoritarian regime, which did very authoritarian things to combat it, like welding people into their homes and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think they, therefore, we, we only had the Chinese Communist Party model to start with. Mm -hmm. um, now, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, the sort of uh, mm -hmm. liberal democracies in Southeast Asia, they all had terrific pandemic responses uh, they generally did quite well in terms of uh, excess mortality and COVID mortality. Uh, but for whatever reason, we chose to follow the first model, that being the authoritarian CCP model, which is now mm. like crashing and burning. Yeah. Um, and it, it's not, it's not just, it, it doesn't just seem that we took their model. Um, their model was promoted by the World Health Organization, of which mm -hmm. um, seemed to be deferential to China. There was mm -hmm. that famous interview where um, Canada's uh, uh, the COVID SAR for the World Health Organization refused to acknowledge the existence of Taiwan and then ended oh, the interview. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and also, it is true, the New York Times has reported that there was a Chinese bot army promoting lockdown in Italy and uh, throughout Europe. Yeah. Um, so th that's not a conspiracy theory. That's, that's in the mm -hmm. New York Times. Um, and then I think medical officers of health are, so although they're legislatively independent, um, it's hard to dismiss one except by ministerial dissent. They're still members of society. They're, they're subject to the same right. uh, pressures that the rest of us were. Um, it's really, really hard to sit on your hands and say, no, I'm not going to do something counterproductive. When people are screaming at you, you're not doing anything. You have blood on your hands. People are dying, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, I really, really had to feel confident when I was not instituting um, some of the other measures that my colleagues in other jurisdictions were 
um, that I understood the science and I understood the data because people were screaming mm -hmm. bloody murder at, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. from the Toronto Star and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it panned out. The proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. uh, adjusted for age, we have a much lower mortality in the in the district that I serve. I right, you were thirty percent lower than the uh, provincial average. And I should point out another way in which uh, your name became known to me was you were actually published in the Toronto Star mm -hmm. uh, early on, about two years ago, or two and a half years ago, alongside um, Chief Medical Officer Lowe, right, who's mm -hmm. in Peel. And you both had contrasting uh, opinions on lockdowns. This was early on. It was November 2020, I believe. Okay, so there you go. Um, and if you read those two pieces side by side now, <laughs> with the evidence of two years, and even the evidence we had then, but we perhaps were afraid to look at it, uh, you know, you come out pretty much on the side of, of, of right. And to your point, uh, there were other um, comparator countries that we could have followed, but we chose not to, or it, it happened that we chose not to. Um, Taiwan never closed its schools. You know, its elementary schools stayed open throughout. Um, so um, this uh, public health officer role that you have now, uh, you, you have announced uh, as of April 1st, it will be uh, your last day in, mm -hmm. in position. What can you tell us, having now been inside of a public health role, um, to maybe guide the public and to understand in the future, are there any guardrails that have come up? I mean, you, you say that most of the province now and most of the country um, seems to be on board with a more traditional public health response. But how, how, are there anything, is there anything from inside your purview that we can do to perhaps not allow this to happen again? And now, getting back to this point, one of the reasons you could be that outspoken is because you're a doctor, you're an ICU doctor. You're back to that original uh, premise or promise of what public health officers were. They had other careers that they could go back to. Do you sense that there's a kind of culture of professionalization around public health in which that is their only role? And if they're not doing that, they have no other job. <laughs> is that too harsh? Um, I can't speak for my colleagues. Okay. Um, I. I worry that that would be the case, right? Like I, I have a background profession that I can go back to, that I am going back to. I'm, I'm choosing to go back to it because I feel that I've completed my mission mm -hmm. with respect to pandemic policy. Mm -hmm. And also for personal reasons, my, my wife's maternity leave and, and where she's ending up. Mm -hmm. um, but I, in general, throughout society, this is a problem that arises where um, uh, something becomes professionalized, managerialized, a, a large bureaucracy, bureaucracy springs up around it. And then uh, members of that bureaucracy serve the bureaucracy rather than uh, the public. That's mm -hmm. that's a common mm -hmm. thing that happens in, in, mm -hmm. in all sorts of social institutions. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I had that independence. I think a, a couple things that might also be guardrails. Mm -hmm. um, the one that we haven't finished sorting out is the role of social media in public policy making. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's why in large part, this pandemic looked different than others. Um, H1N1 was the most recent. Otherwise, yeah. we didn't have um, Twitter mobs screaming at medical officers of health, uh, screaming at uh, government figures. Mm. Um, there, there, there was something, and part of it was the algorithm. Part of it was the executives at Twitter. We now know mm. from the Elon Musk Twitter files yeah. were privileging fear mongering voices over kind of traditional voices. Right. Um, so I, I think. Put, um, some transparency with these tech oligarchs is going to be helpful. Right. Um, and the other thing is we just have to double down on core liberal democratic values. Um, I was saying earlier, I've, I've never been an anarchist. Um, I didn't think that I was wrong when I was pr uh, publishing the things that I was publishing. I was pretty sure I was right. But yeah. also as a, as a journalist, as a, as a uh, professor of medicine, I'm allowed to be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm allowed to be wrong. I'm allowed to publish things that are wrong. And you're allowed to criticize me. Um, and I, I should not have been run out of any organizations um, mm -hmm. for having ideas that were unpopular, uh, not just because they turned out to be right. I, like unpopular ideas should be allowed and should be discussed. And, and mm -hmm. something about the social media milieu means that unpopular things are offensive and therefore are getting cast away. Yeah, it's funny. I, I puzzled over the H1N1 response, which was 2008, 2009. Twitter's only founded in 2007. Like, mm -hmm. It was a public concern. It existed in beta forms. Um, and that transformation from a decade later uh, was quite uh, quite stark. And you're right, the social media role, the, the voices that carried the day were often not the most, um, I would say, published in even the areas in which these mm -hmm. people were opining. Mm 
Um, you don't mind me revealing this, but you were an early signatory to the Great Barrington mm -hmm. Declaration. Is that mm -hmm. correct? For those of the audience that may not know, could you tell them a little bit about that? What that was? Yeah. It, it happened early on in the pandemic. So I think it was also in, in around November 2020, um, uh, some absolute giants in the field of epidemiology and public health, uh, Sinitra Gupta, uh, Jay Bhattacharya, and Michael Kulderf, were from Stanford. Oxford, Hanford, uh, Harvard, and Stanford, mm -hmm. um, extraordinarily well published, well regarded, put together a very traditional document that just said we need to focus on social determinants of health, we need to protect the vulnerable, vulnerable. Um, rather than, you know, rather than having 16 year olds in their basement for two months collecting CERB, let's put that money into protecting mm -hmm. elders and mm -hmm. nursing homes. Um, that document, um, which I was one of the, the first kind of 30 mm -hmm. signatures on it, mm -hmm. um, provoked a firestorm of criticism. Um, Anthony Fauci and Francis Collins at the NIH conspired um, to, to, to take it down mm -hmm. um, rather than to debate it. Um, and it, it was disappeared from Google results um, for uh, a couple of weeks after it was printed, mm. which I, I have the screenshots of. Um, okay. But, and there, there may not ever be Google uh, Google files because I don't think Elon Musk is about to buy Google, but that, <laughs> that, that is a true thing that happened. Right. So this signatory a document that has now over, I think, 100,000 or more, uh, mm. you know, um, it did involve the profession uh, as it was. Um, having seen... Uh, the aftermath, think, think of small businesses, think of the way society was sort of torn up this time last year with the arrival of the protests in Ottawa. Um, the rebuilding of trust, because surveys have shown that public health authorities, trust in medicine even has declined. Mm -hmm. We used to have high, high degrees, especially in Canada, uh, and that's been falling. Mm -hmm. um, the media, again, another institution that we rely on that's so necessary in a democracy, We've seen drops in uh, public trust. We've even seen in early uh, other surveys mistrust of our neighbors. Like we, mm -hmm. you know, if you ask the generic question about measuring social capital, how much do you trust your neighbor? Canada was kind of middle to high. It's seen declines. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, and I think I, I saw a recent uh, um, message you said, which was, "There's only one thing that will have value over time, and that's to tell the truth." So is that is it as simple as that? That we can rebuild trust? by telling the truth? Or is there, is there more work to do even there? I, I, it's, it's the only solution I know. Mm. Um, I think that uh, there were a lot of distortions from the media. There were a lot of distortions about me and what I said and what my mm. record is. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of know they, firsthand. They but, still continue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you can't start telling the truth one day and expect trust to come back that day. It's going to take time. I think apologies, reflection would mm. also be very helpful. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I wish I had something more advanced or interesting to say. I think, I think that's it. If you want people to trust you, you have to tell the truth. And it has to be sustained. I think yes. that's important. Actually, you just hit on, the, on an idea, though, um, which is the apologies. There haven't been any apologies for closing schools. There haven't been any apologies for forcing um, family members not to be at the bedside of mm -hmm. their loved ones when they were dying. That happened. You mentioned the nursing homes. Report after report, even the first military... Uh, report that came out when the military was called in showed that the bulk of those deaths, which were listed as COVID deaths, in a sense they were, but they were COVID policy deaths because they died from malnourishment, mm. from lack of uh, care, food. They died in their rooms without even getting, being taken to hospitals. No apologies there. Um, do, you, do you think that would have a, a, an opening or would it provide an opening to those that have felt kind of wounded over the last two years? Uh, and, and if so, do you see a uh, person, anyone, in, because you've been inside the public health field, at least now, and you have colleagues, do you see anyone talking about that <laughs> uh, possibility? So the, the first question, would it help? Yes. The second question, do I see any move towards that? Absolutely not. Hmm. I, I, I would say that um, uh, even as evidence has built up showing that earlier responses were uh, not ideal, mm -hmm. um, Folks have changed what they think we should do next, right? But I, I've not seen really anyone uh, willing to say that we shouldn't have done what we did. Like the, the vaccine mandates, uh, I would say the, the official party line is the vaccine mandates were perfect and appropriate right until we decided to get rid of them. And it's just a coincidence that truckers had to be it were, <laughs> happened to be in the nation's capital when we made that decision. Unrelated, um, it, they, they served their purpose, and, and now we're moving on. Mm. Um, so I think I think for several years yet that will be the uh, official. Yeah, Mine. yeah. Well, the, 
but they do point to push back a little uh, to the evolution of the science and the variants. So that Omicron, they claim, changed the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could quite you could say that's probably true. Uh, but you're right. The Omicron did change the game, but it was changing it in the fall of 2021. And it happened that on February, March, we, we decided to sort of end that experiment. But just the last point, it hasn't ended for everyone. There are still uh, medical units in, a, in our province and in others that have prevented uh, staff from returning who, who either chose not to reveal their status and... Uh, oh, most. My most, understanding is most hospitals are requiring... Uh, well, Back vaccination. Is there any movement there amongst colleagues to see that change? Or do you think it's an internal policy now that's wedded by people who made different choices and who don't want those persons to return? Or is this, why is it not happening? We have shortages. Why I have a speculation, but maybe you can speak to because you're the, you're the labor yeah, relations yeah, expert. But um, no, I would like to uh, Like My inside. suspicion is that once they say, oh yeah, that was wrong, they would be opening themselves up to all sorts of legal action. So, so I, I think it seems to me that there's a, a bit of an omerta to say, no, it's perfect the way it is, it's necessary, and we're not looking at the science evolving in, in this setting. But within the hospital setting, would these people be well received if they came back? Um, I can't speak for everyone. I would receive them well. Um, I, others may not. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, a lot of, I have had the opportunity to speak to some nurses who left mm -hmm. hospital settings. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not going back. I see. Um, they, <laughs> they, they feel that what happened to them was wrong. Right. Uh, they, you know, they, they, in March, 2020, COVID was really scary. Yeah. Um, yeah. They showed up to work. Yeah. They didn't have the opportunity to be vaccinated. No. Um, they put their lives on the line for a Better year before year. vaccinations became widely available to them. Um, some of them, because they had natural immunity, decided yeah. that it wasn't something that they needed, yeah. um, and they feel discarded. So I, I don't. Yeah, uh, it's going to take a lot of bridge building to get them back. And that uh, that brings us back to that story that you just mentioned about how how to rectify this um, or right the shift, which is truth and and reconciliation, mm -hmm. truth and apologies. Um, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dr. Strauss, uh, for coming and talking to us today and reaching an audience that. Uh, Hopefully, maybe hadn't heard of you if they weren't in Ontario, but now they have. And I think I have some feeling that they'll be hearing about from you uh, in the future, uh, both because you have um, not your only medical career, but your journalistic skills, I'm sure, will be um, on display. So thanks again, Matt. Um, after the uh, short break, I'll come back and have a few words to summarize uh, what we've just heard. So stay tuned and join us after the break. I think it was necessary, and uh, yeah, Unf unfortunately, but it was necessary. Although I don't have, I have only grandchildren; they uh, they suffered on it. I don't think they should close the, the schools. Absolutely not. Maybe they should uh, bring back the masks, uh, but I don't think they should close the schools at all. I think it, it harms the kids more than it do them good. And the parents, you know, they have to struggle uh, for babysitting. They will lose uh, work, you know, and people are already struggling to make ends meet, you know. So I don't think they should close the schools at all. It was hard. So I, I have a son that uh, went through that and uh, it definitely impacted him. It impacted, uh, um, he does not do well on screen and, um, and he missed the interactions of social social boy and he missed the interaction with other kids but again i i thought that at least for a certain period of time it was it was needed because uh, we needed to get some control over the spread of the virus uh <clears throat> i think not only because I, I think the education system isn't well organized and what i i do think is that there should be a voucher system where instead of sending children to schools uh public schools the parents get a voucher to send their child to any accredited school so that basically privately operated schools community-based schools would would take the initiative and i i think a big bureaucratic uh, system isn't too functional so that when they close the schools for covid I would say that that's a reflection of their 
weakness in terms of getting organized and responding to the needs of kids. I think it was necessary at that time. Uh, now, maybe not. It's not as bad as it was. I don't think so, at least anyway. But, you know, if it gets worse in the winter, they, they probably should make it mandatory for people who work, you know, in, in the, like in the food uh, sector, uh, in stores, and, you know, when you come in contact with other people to uh, protect themselves and protect the, the, the clients too. Yeah. I, yes, I mind it, but I know it was right. In my opinion, it was okay, yeah. I, 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 we have to curb the spread of, of COVID, and one of the things is not traveling. I personally don't disagree. I, I, I do uh, see valid points for people that, that are against it. Um, however, I, I think the, the conspiracies that were out there were um, yeah, they were definitely uh, <laughs> out of left field, let's say. Welcome back. One of our major goals with Speaking Freely has been to provide a venue for interesting and credible voices that are all too often dismissed or just missed by mainstream media. Speaking Freely was meant to be a place to allow these voices to opine, but also to dissent. And perhaps most importantly, we wanted people on the show who were both rigorous and whose views, though perhaps controversial, were also evidence-based. So from the beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Matt Strauss has been one of those voices challenging the validity of accepted narratives around COVID policy. And as he pointed out in our interview today, for every positive medical intervention, there's also the possible downside that it can bring. And in this respect, Canada's emulation of restrictive policies from authoritarian regimes, such as those in China, has in many instances been shown to have been ill-advised and at times even reckless. And while it was certainly defensible, perhaps at the beginning of the pandemic, to take aggressive steps towards protecting the public from what could have been a out of control virus. By not prioritizing the safety of our vulnerable populations, like the elderly in care homes or temporary foreign workers who were working in poorly ventilated workplaces, we made a huge collective mistake. And instead we imposed coercive and onerous restrictions on groups less likely to face serious health con consequences, like those working in offices or healthy teens. And as a result, we created a widespread social upheaval that in many ways should have and could have been prevented. And we ignored the mountain of evidence that has indicated that the social and psychological factors in our lives are really crucial determinants of overall health and we paradoxically made the health of otherwise healthy people worse. Now, this is sometimes referred to as a Rosetto mystery. Now, Rosetto was a small community in central Pennsylvania, and its inhabitants for years outlived their counterparts, and they were healthier than the rest of the Pennsylvanian and American population. Now, what made Rosettoans so healthy? Was it their genes? Was it their diet? Well, that was the first thought. Rosetto was settled by Italian immigrants, and it was first thought that something in their genes or their diet, a Mediterranean diet high in natural foods and healthy oils, was the key. Well, it turns out Rosettoans did not eat any better. In fact, they ate worse than the average American and were more likely to smoke than the average Pennsylvanian. So no, it turns out the key to longevity in Rosetto, Pennsylvania, was the social life and the strong community that had been built up over successive generations. The original Italian immigrants and their descendants had kept their close family ties and their intergenerational style of living. And the community itself was also just more social and lived in closer proximity to each other. However, once this type of social dynamic began to wane, 
with newer generations preferring to move out to larger but more distant suburban communities. The Rosetto protective effect disappeared and all its positive health outcomes fell back to state and national averages. So the lesson of Rosetto is actually what public health experts have always known prior to COVID and which they espoused, that the social and economic determinants of health are key to ensuring not only longevity, but a reduction in illnesses, things like heart disease and cancer, and yes, even infections. The prolonged loneliness and social isolation that was part of the main COVID response in Canada and many other parts of the world, now three years on, I think can be acknowledged to have led to a wide variety of adverse health outcomes. And in this crucial area, the government's pandemic policy made an important error, the consequences of which we'll be living with as a society for a long time to come. So with that, we'll end this episode of Speaking Freely. But as always, I would encourage you to be curious and compassionate in equal measure. Thank you.